So I want you all to look at each other and to smile. <laughs> I'm not sure how you tell, but I think you, maybe by your eyebrows or something like that. I want to say good morning to you and welcome. Uh, it is so wonderful to be in church together. You know, I don't know how you are, but I'm kind of getting tired of this COVID thing. Um, and, and, and it, you know, every once in a while it kind of sneaks up on me and hits me. You know, I miss seeing the people and on these special days where we do things that are a little bit different, either through Holy Communion or to remember your baptism. I, I miss that personal contact that as a pastor I get to have with each of you. So, you know, do keep your pastor and staff in prayer. Um, we keep you in prayer, and um, we'll get through this, and we're going to continue to do the right thing and the good thing until we do, uh, but it is, um, it is a real, real challenge at times. If there's anything that gets on me and wears me down and gets me a little bit depressed, it's what happens here and missing and not seeing people. So it's good to see you all and welcome. And I'll tell you, if you have any questions or if you'd like to have a discussion, I mean, I'm hungry for those. Bob came by this week, and we had a really wonderful discussion on just stuff. Um, my office is open to you. We sit, like, across the room from one another and shout. Um, but, you know, we don't really shout. But, you know, it's really good. I, I love those questions. I've had asked two questions today already, um, one of which is a great one. So I want you to ponder this question. Kim Constantino asked, if when we die, we go to heaven, and if the Bible also says when we die that the trump sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, what's right? It's a good question, isn't it? So we're all going to turn to Jim for the answer. And <laughs> but you know, ponder that. You know, all those realities that it talks about, you know, that persons when they die, they're in heaven. And I believe that. I also believe that persons that when the trumpet of God at the end of the time of time sounds. We all rise, and yet I hold that intention. I don't know how I do that, but I do. And so be thinking about it, some questions and things like that. I love doing those things, and during these times of COVID, it gives us a chance to, to talk and to converse and all kinds of stuff. So welcome, welcome this morning. Just a few announcements. One is today I'm going to make a runny exit from church. Not to get away from you, not even to get away from Lynn. Um, but the youth are doing something really cool today. Um, we are taking a car van, and if United Methodist men did that a little bit back, and United Methodist women did that, uh, now the youth are doing it, and we're going to be visiting the homes of some of our shut-ins and raising a ruckus. We're going to honk and turn our lights off and on and wave and just remind people that we care about them. Because it's very hard to be in contact with some people because they don't do the internet, they don't do Facebook and things like that. And that's okay, that's their life experience, but we're gonna to try to do our best. So pray for the kids as they drive and the adults as they drive, and Sharon has put this together, so thanks to Sharon as well. So at one o'clock, we're gonna head out on that. Um, also, I want to tell you the Bible study, the new Bible study is coming up. It's called On the Way to the Cross, On the Road to the Cross. Um, it's just a really neat one. It's one that I started reading because I thought it looked interesting and I liked it. And in the bulletin and in constant contact, you can see about the starting of that. Also, I want to tell you that uh, several people during this time of COVID have asked about what is the church doing or should we be in more discussion about um, Potential splits or separations in the United Methodist Church due to question, excuse me, questions about human sexuality. And here's how I will address that. Um, the answer is no. We, we shouldn't be. Don't need to be right now because anything that I tell you is simply conjecture. We do not have, we, you know, we were talking about the protocol in the past. Um, that hasn't passed because we have not met in, in general conference. And what happens is, you know, it's like with the American government. You have a group here, and they vote one way or the other, then it just passes down to it gets to our local church level. Because of COVID-19 and all the things associated with it, General Conference hasn't met, 
and then we have the protocol that was going to be voted on, and now a new plan, which looks even better, um, is out there, and that would be, I think, a, a good plan to move forward with. And it's not, we can't vote on it until we meet a general conference, which is still in the future. So um, we're where we are. So what do we do until we have some kind of decision? And once we have a way forward, we'll share all the information with you. So what do we do? We continue to make disciples from the of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We don't stop what we're tasked with doing. We just keep doing it and being faithful. And I know we have a variety of thoughts on this topic, and that's okay. We don't have to be the same. But I do want us as a church to become and to be, to live into being a type of people who can respectfully, lovingly, and with great compassion for persons discuss and dialogue about important issues and not fight or argue over them. Uh, the, the fighting and arguing doesn't get anyone anywhere. But to talk to one another about important topics in which we disagree and agree, that's part of being an adult, that's part of our faith, and it's just crucial. So right now, if you're curious, and I've been asked by several people, everything's on hold because of COVID all across the church, all across the world, and so we're just waiting until um, there's a vote. Now here's Dale's 50 cent piece extra. One of the things that I prayerfully hope for is that this delay and maybe a refocusing of our priorities will allow us as a denomination to stay together. I'm not one who wants to separate or divide for any reason. Other clergy who feel differently than me have been friends for 25 and 30 years, some of them, and I don't like losing friends. Um, so we're going to be able to talk together as adults, and we're going to pray for our church and hope that in the future um, we'll have some kind of decision, but uh, maybe that decision will be that we're better together, representing to the world that there's a different way, um, and, and, and hope that we can be models, and the good will come out of delay. That's where we are. Um, another thing to, to sort of just be aware of that as we look at today, today is the baptism of our Lord Sunday, the time when Jesus comes to be baptized and we'll be hearing about from the Gospel of Mark. Um, in a way, in an effort to be safe, out that door is a small table with a multicolored bowl. And in that bowl, is water and marbles. Some of you remember, might remember how last year we took marbles and we were up here and several people have come to me and said, I lost my marbles and others have said, I've got my marble and all kinds of things. You don't have to do this. This is not required of anyone. But if you want to touch the water, if you want to make the sign of the cross on your forehead or your hand, if you want to reach it and take a marble, there's different colors there. Um, it's up to you, but this is the act that we're going to do. Normally, I would make the mark on your forehead or your hand, and you can select a marble. Um, we're not doing that. We can't do it right now. Um, but this is the best alternative that Maude and I can come up with in a safe way. So please do that. Prayer, the prayer ministry, we're not calling it a prayer team, but prayer ministry is sponsoring its very first event tomorrow morning. From 10 until 12, the sanctuary will be open, and we invite you to come and pray for, your, for our nation. I can only speak for myself, but I was absolutely horrified at the events that took place in the Capitol. Uh, I will say to you as a Christian and as a citizen of this great nation, two things. First, I'm very proud to be an American. I love this country. I value this country and what it stands for, and I was deeply hurt by what happened this past week. I received several phone calls from people who were because of being isolated and age and all kinds of stuff, and even younger people, who were, who were afraid. It frightened people, and it should frighten us, maybe into changing the way we do things. The second thing is, um, any form of violence against another person for a cause, well, that cause being important and valuable, it's just simply wrong. I don't care if you're on one end of the spectrum or the other. There is never room for violence 
or destruction of personal property or person's life. And um, you know, it's just it's just unacceptable. Um, so without placing blame, without assigning responsibility, without making any kind of partisan or political statements, I invite you to come and pray. As a Christian, I know that's a priority for me. I will be here. The prayer team, prayer ministry, I'm sorry, will be here. It's not, there's no speeches, there's no service. It's just simply a time to pray. And the sacrament will be here because I think at the sacrament, the sacrament here reminds us at the core that we are followers of Jesus. And I know you guys, and I want to be more like Jesus with every day we live. So that's a lot of stuff. And it's good to see you. Um, how many of you remember going to school and the teacher would walk in and they'd say, take out a piece of paper and a pencil and we're gonna have a, a pop quiz? Do you remember that? <laughs> how many of you hated that day? It was always in those classes for which I was not prepared. I'm just gonna tell you that you guys should get the pop quiz on baptism today. So get your paper ready, get your notes ready, kind of think about baptism and we'll have some fun with it and we'll learn some things and we'll recommit our lives to Christ. So welcome to church. And Dick, thank you for our prayer and the answer. <laughs>
for we desire to dwell in the assurance of your light and love today. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship by standing, leaving your masks on and participating in a responsive reading. Do you hear God calling you to this place? Yes, I hear you. Will you listen and be the voice of God today to share of God's love and light? Yes,
to move forward. That we all move forward together. And that we as a nation commit ourselves to valuing and respecting life and the value and the opinion of everyone. And that we as a nation find a way to sit down and to discuss with one another and to value the opinions of those who differ most from us. That we might not fight or harm or injure, but that we might come together as a people whose high ideals are lived out in how they live with one another. And we pray, knowing that it's so easy to affix blame, it's so easy to say the other person is wrong, but we come to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We do pray today that for those persons who are frightened or afraid, who feel isolated and alone, even because of the COVID and now seeing this and other things that happen, we just ask you to give them comfort and courage. And for all of us, help us to be, as Christians, the person who steps across the line and values and loves and cares, regardless of our divisions, regardless of what we think or feel. Gracious and loving God, we pray for our country. We give thanks for this nation, for those who have served it with dignity and honor. We give thanks for our first responders and people who risk their lives and their well-being for our own good. We give thanks for our leaders and we pray that they will help us to be aware of the needs of our citizens, particularly those who are most vulnerable, like our elderly, our children, and our young adults. And we pray, Terry Christ, that we again might be a nation that can exert moral direction because of the profound respect that people around the world have for us. We pray these things because we desire them. All of us desire them. And so we trust you to be at work in us as we assume our responsibility to be at work for you. And we pray for the COVID-19 pandemic. God, I must confess, I'm so tired. I just simply pray that soon, very, very soon, we will have a disbursement of vaccines and the things we need to move forward, and that we can again look others face to face, eye to eye, and see in each other a sister and a brother. And caring Christ, we pray for our church and its mission and ministry. We pray for safety for our young adults and youth today. We pray for our shut-ins and those who can't be with us and who maybe are afraid. They have a legitimate fear, and we want to be careful and safe in all our practices. A wonderful Christ. With tender hearts, we pray for those who grieve, for those who are experiencing health concerns, for those who are struggling financially, for all, for we know that we are one people. Under you. This we pray in the name of our Christ. I invite you to take a few moments of silent prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. because she was supposed to be reading this. <laughs> um, but she can't be here today. So please now hear the Bible reading for today, Mark 1, 9-14. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. We will now have him 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Now here in Mark, we see this text at the very first start of the Gospel. And each of the Gospels has its own focus and direction for where to Jesus begins his ministry. And in doing that, we have a better, more complete, more full understanding of the life of Jesus. If you were to read the Gospel of John, John begins with a prologue. And John talks about the pre-existent Christ that was before and a part of the act of creation. Matthew and Luke tell the wonderful stories of the nativity, the shepherds and the wise men and Jesus and Mary and Joseph. Mark begins at the place where Jesus' ministry as an adult begins. And this text is unique in a couple of ways. One way is it shows us uh, how the Trinity interacts among the three members of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, but three expressions or three persons of that one God. If I were to use a symbol to explain it to you, I would say Think of water, steam, and ice. All the same thing, but different expressions of that reality. And in this text we see that because the Father is seen through the voice, the Holy Spirit through the dove, and of course Jesus is physically present as he's baptized by John in the Jordan River. The term for that is a theophany. And that's very rare, only two or three or four times in the entirety of the Bible. And it's an interesting text because we see Jesus coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now, I know that you have heard about John the Baptist, but John the Baptist is a really odd duck. Because, first of all, how many of you have ever been near, smelled, touched, ridden a camel? <laughs> now, for those who had that experience, and I have too, um, I'm just going to tell you, I'm a dog guy. I like my dogs. Cats are okay. Dogs go to heaven. I'm not sure about cats. But, you know, I like dogs, and I like horses you know, somewhere in there too. But I have no great desire to ever ride a camel again. They are ugly. They smell bad. They're hairy, and they make you itch for the next three weeks after you've ridden them. So here is John the Baptist out in the desert wearing camel hair clothing. Now, Jim, remember the old camel hair suits and sport coats and things? I think that the liner made it safe, but I don't know. There's just nothing about camel hair that I have a whole lot of desire to do. How many of you, when you get home, have taken out your locust and wild honey? And John's message was just hard. Repent. Or die. That's basically it. And he challenged religious leaders who, who came out into the desert to hear him, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, who told you to flee from the wrath that is to come? John was not an easy person. He saw things as one extreme or the other, but there was very little in between. Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Jesus does not cut in line. He just simply stands there and waits his turn. And when John sees him, he knows immediately who it is. In another gospel, he'll say, I'm not worthy to be baptized. You're not, I should, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Instead, you should baptize me. Jesus says, no, we're going to fulfill what the scripture says. And because of a strong belief that if Jesus did it or said it, that we should emulate that, and because we need to commit and covenant ourselves together in this new year, in this new day, this time of beginnings, as we talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry, then we are going to talk this morning about baptism. And first, we're going to talk a little bit about what do the United what does the United Methodist Church believe about baptism, 
And we're going to do that in a fun kind of way by taking a quiz. And I want to say about this quiz, I don't want us looking around and seeing that Julie got the answer right or wrong and then giving her a hard time later because she only got three out of nine and I got eight out of nine. We're not here to, to make fun of or to critique. And I particularly don't want that happening with your husband and wife. Um, but we're here to simply have fun and to learn and listen and maybe to laugh a little bit. Because I will tell you that I understand baptism pretty much as we as a church do. Because I've been taught baptism and I teach baptism to persons who are coming through the process of ministry. And my favorite thing that happens in and around a baptism is I get a phone call that sounds like this. Reverend Brown is with us. How are you doing? Fine, how are you? Fine. Um, I'd like to have my child done. <laughs> well, I'm bad on occasion, and my mind just goes all kinds of ways. I know what they're saying, but they, I want to have my child done. I said, you mean baptized? Yeah, I want to have her done. And I said, okay, we plan ahead. And then we get into the course of the conversation of preparatory counseling for baptism. We talk about what it means and why it's important. But that is the number one way. If you call me and say, I'd like to have my child done, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it happens in every appointment I have served. So are you ready for your quiz? All right, here we go. Most of these are yes or no. I'm going to try to phrase them so that they're easy to respond to. And we're going to talk about each one as we go through it because we don't have it written down and we don't have that kind of opportunity at the present time. So we'll just have some fun. Okay, number one. Does baptism make you a member of the church? If you think so, raise your hand. If you think it does not, please raise your hand. Okay, some of you didn't vote, and that's okay. But the truth is, it does not make you a member of the church. What, do you remember there was a, a, a role in the life of the church, more so in older days than now today, called the constituency role? Constituency role were persons who had been baptized either as children or adults, but were not yet members of the church. We don't really talk about constituency roles and preparatory roles, which were unbaptized children in the life of the church, but not much anymore. But it does not make you a member of the church. As an adult, you can join the church by confessing your faith in Jesus Christ. And as a youth, or, and also as an adult, you can join the church through the process of confirmation, which we're going to actually start doing in, in February. So you're 100% so far. All right, number two, do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? Do you think yes, raise your hand. Do you think no, raise your hand. Okay, doing good so far. Um, baptism is really important, and I will preach and teach and talk about baptism but the ultimate, most important thing is what do you do with Jesus? And if you confess Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, put your trust and hope in Him, He will not let you down. And that means whether you've been baptized or not. In, in Catholic hospitals years ago, there used, they had empowered nurses to baptize children that were nearing death. Because at that point in time, they believed in the need for baptism as one of the acts of grace. We have never believed that, and I don't think the Catholic Church believes that today. Um, so um, just know that you don't have to be baptized. But it's really, really, really important. Number three, is there anything special about the water? Do we have holy water? So if you say yes, just raise your hand. If you say no, raise your hand. Okay, the answer is no. There's nothing special about the water. The truth is, we get it out of the tap in the bathroom. <laughs> and I don't say that to be funny, but I say that because it's not the it's not the water. Like, you know, it's not the grape juice, right? We can buy any kind of grape juice. It's that God's grace is given to us through ordinary things, taking on extraordinary realities. That's what we call a sacrament. So in the United Methodist Church, we have two sacraments, baptism, Communion. Other churches have more. We just have the two. I remember when I was traveling as a youth to Israel and Egypt and other places that some of the dear ladies from Pokemon from First Baptist Church 
would purchase these um, like containers, plastic containers of water from the Jordan River. And their intention was to bring it home and to put a little bit of that water in the baptismal font or the baptismal in the Baptist church when people were baptized so there was a connection. And I remember that the next day after they purchased that water that I noticed their clothes were wet because those little containers had broken open in their suitcases and poured water everywhere. And I was, you think I'm bad now. I was horrible as a teenager picking fun at people. And I was like, what happened to you? And they was like, don't ask me. So you know, there's nothing special about the water. The water represents the love of God and the grace of God and all those things that we hold dear. And if you, if you do have Jordan River water and you want to place it in the font as a way of connecting or remembering, that's fine. But every baptism counts in that way. Number four, how many times may you be baptized? Anybody want to suggest how many times you think you can be, can you be baptized an infinite number of times? Can, can you, can you, and yes, don't be afraid, we will not talk about you too much. Um, can you be baptized only once? Okay, here's the truth. As a United Methodist pastor, I am allowed to only baptize you one time. And if you come and say to me, you know, I was baptized as an infant, but I don't remember it. Um, I'd like to be baptized now that I've had a new experience with Jesus. Can I baptize you? And the answer is no, I cannot. Um, I just can't do it. John would talk the same stuff. Um, because we place the emphasis in baptism on a slightly different location. I grew up watching Billy Graham because of my father's love for George Beverly Shea. And so Dr. Graham, who I have profound respect for, would talk about the people responding to the call to accept Christ, right? You see that they would come forward and they would accept Christ. We as United Methodists believe that the Initiative is on God, and God is constantly reaching out to us in love, calling us into relationship. And if you, when you have your hymnals back, look through, you'll see something called prevenient grace, the grace that goes before. So we place the emphasis on the fact that God is the initiator of the relationship, always reaching out to us, and baptism is one way that God does that. And I'm aware that God does everything perfectly. And so once we have been baptized, we have been touched by God in that fashion, and anything subsequent to that is a renewal or a convert, a, a, a recommitment to our vows. I've tried all kinds of ways to be respectful of people's wishes. I've stood at the sides of a pool or a pond, praying for them as some other denomination's pastor that rebaptizes. By discipline, I cannot rebaptize you. Um, because God doesn't care. But I will support your decision in any way as a pastor I can. And that is really, there are some limits on the things that I can and cannot do. But we believe only one baptism per life. Now, in this case, do as I say, not as I do, because I've been baptized three times. Once in the Jordan River, uh, once when I left the Methodist Church and Methodist Church and came, before I came back. Um, you know, we're all in different places. I'm just simply saying that please don't be offended if I come to me with that scenario and I say I can't do it because I don't can't um, in our tradition. Does a United Methodist pastor ever christen or dedicate someone? Yes? How about no? The answer is no. We do not christen, we do not dedicate, we baptize. So if you put me and you and water, and I take that water and place it upon your head or your, your hand or whatever you're asking me to do in that fashion, you're baptized. Christening is a part of the baptismal liturgy, particularly in the past when in England we were given a Christian name that identified us and our families for tax records death records and all kinds of things because the records were kept in the church for many years. That was the source of those records. We don't christen. Christening is giving a name. Now, here's a difference in this. How many of you have ever seen a ship christened? 
where they take the champagne bottle and they bring it over the bow. That's christening. They're saying, this is the Queen Mary, or this is the community church ship, or whatever it is. Um, but it's not baptism. And we don't do that. And there is no church that I know of, no mainline, mainline denominational church that christens. The Episcopal Church then, they baptize. In the Catholic Church, they baptize. In our church, we baptize. We don't christen, we don't do any of that kind of stuff. And we don't dedicate, because what we think is, you know, in Methodists is that dedication is the recommitment, the reaffirmation of our vows. All right, getting closer. Um, what, as a United Methodist, am I only allowed to, and I hate this term, sprinkle water on people? Or can I baptize in other ways? Do you think yes? Say yes. Do you think no? Say no. <laughs> Jake, you didn't decide. <laughs> so I'll let you know what's going on. We can baptize in any reasonable mode that's necessary. As an infant, I will uh, sprinkle water on your forehead or the forehead of your child or grandchild. John Wesley got in trouble in Georgia because he believed in the triune immersion of infants, name of the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit, you can imagine his horrified mothers and fathers who watched their child be dunked under water and brought back up three times. Um, one of the things that got him in trouble in Georgia. But I, you know, I was I went to a Mennonite college and they baptized by pouring. And we can do that, we can immerse you. I've gone and stood, as I said, with people when they were baptized by immersion. It's not the mood, it's the heart and the deep commitment that God is present at the baptism. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of openness as well as there is um, some things that we cannot do as well. All right, well, a couple more here. Should baptism always take place in the life of, or in the time of worship at the church? Yes or no? Um, the answer is yes. And the key is to use the word always. Um, we believe that baptism is an act of God's grace in the life of the church. That's why it's described in the discipline and in Dr. Sufi's books and all the writings about baptism. Why is that? Okay, in a minute we're going to walk through the liturgy that has to do with baptism. And you all and I will promise to do certain things on behalf of that child and that family. Now there are some exceptions. If a person is near death, or hospitalized or too ill, and they ask me out of the concern for them to baptize them in their home, I will absolutely do that. But I will come back Sunday morning and tell you what I did. Because you know, we, we don't want to harm anyone. We believe that baptism is important, but we are a church family. And I think maybe an analogy of this is when you see that beautiful little baby being baptized. I've never seen that other beautiful little baby, more like that baby's aunts, uncles, and cousins. And that's what should always take place in the life of the church. The other time kind of baptism, age group that I've baptized outside the life of the church are teenagers. And you know how some teenagers don't like to be up in front of people? It's embarrassing. I'm not going to embarrass anybody in baptism, but I believe it would be so important that they understand that the ideal is that we're baptized in the context of our church family. All right, last question is this one. How old, I didn't know, sorry. Are you baptized? And that's an important question. As your pastor here, I would consider it an honor if you have not been baptized to baptize you. And if you don't know or not sure, I err on the side of caution and I will do the baptism. If you do know, I can't do it, as I mentioned. But if you are not baptized, it is important, it is a sacrament, and I encourage you to do it. And I leave that simply with you. I'm not going to walk into baptism, to a church service and go down the aisle and say, are you baptized? But you know how important I feel it is and how important your church feels it is. So continuing on, what does it mean that we reaffirm or recommit to our baptismal vows? 
Let me just mention about four things very, very quickly. First, it means that we become part of God's universal family. I think heaven is going to be a blast. I am not worried about trying to do things or find things to do in heaven. I'm not worried about whether they allow golf in heaven or fishing in heaven uh, or whether the Orioles win the pennant in heaven or any of those things. I'm just going to be fascinated to meet brothers and sisters in Christ from places that I have never been and to focus that relationship that we have together in and around the person of Christ. You know, we celebrate the fact that God's church is expressed here at Community Church. And we are attentive to the things that this church does and says and to being here and to worshiping virtually if we're not able, or to, to being engaged in all the activities of the church. But God's church is huge. And don't for one minute think God is not caring for his church during COVID. Not just in how you all have supported and given to your church, but think about persons around the world. I like to think back to people that were that passed away before I was born, before I really lived. I'm the youngest of this generation of my family. There are lots of relatives that I didn't know, and I think of them as being in heaven, so I can go and see and meet them. God's church is enormous. There are Christians in every nation of the world, practicing their faith in many distinct and different ways. And there is so much that brings us together rather than divides us. I mean, I'm waiting to, to, to meet brothers and sisters in the reality of a place where there's no more tears or heartache or pain or death or dying and just to spend eternity with them. The church and its church family excites me. And we become a part of that great family of God which transcends time and space and geography and language when we are united all together in the presence of God. And I think that's important. Secondly, I, I don't know about you, but I get distracted easily. And sometimes I forget. I have reached a stage in life in which I, I, I find myself sometimes going in a room and not remembering why I went there. I know that no one has had that experience before. So, you know, and I find sometimes too that Maybe I get focused on the wrong thing. I think it's human, but we need reminders. One of the things that happens a lot in the Old Testament is when they did something new or something consequential, they erected a set of stones to remind them that when they came this way again, what had happened here, what went on here. I need those reminders. I do not remember my first baptism. I was in. I can show you the place where it happened. I can tell you the time and date because I have the certificate. I can even tell you that Reverend Beckwith did the baptism. But I can't tell you a lot of detail. But I can be reminded and remember and reaffirm my baptism. And in doing so, I'm reminded of the claims that God has on my life and my faith and my promises that I have made before God. And I'm still a believer that when you make a promise to God, it's serious, it's not to be taken lightly, and it's to be lived into. So I'll ask you, those vows, time, talent, gift, service, and now witness, that were either made in your behalf or that you made, how's it going? And would you like to reconnect, reaffirm, recommit? Number three, it's following the example of Jesus. And one of the great things I learned from the Mennonites when I was in college is this. If Jesus says and does it, then it's for us. We are to be imitators of Christ. Karl Barber has said that we are to be little Jesus to everyone we meet. Um, you know, I think if Jesus did it, then we can't go wrong in doing and saying what Jesus did. It just makes sense to me that way. And the final thing is, it renews our covenant with God. Now, a covenant is something special and unique. It's not a contract. I mean, we've all signed contracts. 
It's not a handshake agreement, it's a covenant. What does a covenant mean? A covenant means that God is always faithful to God's covenants. That God always keeps God's side of the covenant. And that we, who like the ancient Israelites that we read about in the Old Testament, the people throughout history are the ones that fail. But a covenant is the fact that God is faithful to us. So when we commit to God to live our lives as followers of Jesus, God honors that commitment, and God will always honor that commitment. It's, it's in the character of God to do so. So I invite you at this time to recommit to your baptismal vows. And what I'm going to do is lead you through this service as part of our, our bulletin. It's going to be right here for the most part. And I'm going to pause in different sections and tell you like where it is and how it's important. I know we're going to be a few minutes over, but it's okay. Um, you know, and things. So let's begin. And I will tell you that the first four questions that I ask you are directly out of your membership vows. So baptism and membership go hand in hand. It's the same liturgy for both. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and we are given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift, again emphasizing God's initiative offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared in our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing in and for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So I ask you, on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you do, please say, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If you do, please say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If you do, please say, I do. And the next one is, I will. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If you will, please say, I will. And again, it's not doing wrong, not sinning, living for Christ, doing the good, and believing. So it's both action and word. Now, the next section is a way of sharing in the Apostles' Creed together. And remember how I had to memorize the Apostles' Creed for confirmation and things? So don't worry if you have forgotten it um, and, and things, but we'll work through this together. So let us join in this historic profession of the Christian faith. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And that last section uses the word universal. When I grew up, it used the word Catholic in the capital C, um, not meaning the Catholic Church, but that the fact that the Church belonged to God and was inclusive of all people, Catholic meaning universal or general. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark from water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, 
you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of the womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called us his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on this gift of water. May this gift of water call us to our to call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. You have washed away our sin and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives. That dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. And again, that righteousness is Martin Luther would have used the term imputed from God to us. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Okay. And as you enter, or as you go to the thought, that's your choice, the bowl out there this morning. You can say to yourself, if you're here by yourself or alone, um, I remember my baptism and give thanks. Well, let's say you're a husband, wife, or close friends, whatever you all as persons choose, you can say to each other, Holy Spirit, work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So let us pray. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. As members of the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live
Thank you, Sal. We are so fortunate to have you here, so thank you so much. We are. Let us pray together as we pray for our offering. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not only with our lips but with our whole lives, turning the duties and sorrows and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is 469, Dick, Jesus is all the world.